So now we start with a new book, the book of Shemot. Shemot means names, right? Because the word in singular is Shem, and Shemot is in plural. Chachamim uh, tell us, Chazal tell us, that the book of Shemot used to be called Sefer Hashani, the second book. And surprisingly, the third and the fourth and the fifth book were never called the third book, the fourth book, yes, Sefer Shlishi, Sefer Revi, Sefer Hamishi. It was not called like that by Chazal. The only book that's called Sefer Hashani is Sefer Shemot. So the, the, the Gemara explains that the, one of the reasons that it's called the Sefer Hashemi is because Sefer Shemot is another beginning, which means Sefer Bereshit is a one long story of our fathers, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, which what we call them Avot HaMerkava. Of course, the fourth wheel is called David, yes, but let's put it first as the first Merkava, which is Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. What does it mean that they were Avot a Merkava? Merkava is from the word uh, when you try to combine certain things to create a whole new picture. So you combine, you integrate, you, you put them together. So Avot, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, that as we all know, Abraham gave us the concept of chesed, Yitzchak gave us the concept of gvura, Yaakov gave us the concept of, of, of uh, emet, tiferet, and Yosod gave us the yesod, yesod which from it goes to the malchut, and malchut is our world, the way we combine all aspects of this universe. So why is Sefer Shemot is called Sefer Hashemi? because now we are dealing with the children of Yaakov who have now a very specific role in fulfilling the goal of God. And that is Lamshich et al to uh, create a continuous illumination to the world and to take from every part of the universe, every part that there is a culture, including their own, to bring the light, the illumination, the kdusha, the holiness, from the lowest of all the lowest points that are on earth. And we're going to elaborate more a little bit about it in a minute. So, so that is when, the, when we talk about the name of the book that's called the Sefer Asheni, which is another beginning. And then it says here, the El Shemot Bnei Israel, Rabbi Mitzrayim. Now, if you look at the end of Sefer Bereshit. We already know their names. It's already said their names. What is it that the Torah again repeats and says, the Ever Shemot Bene Israel Habaim Mitzrayma? But we know, but we know why that uh, uh, um, they already uh, were in Egypt. Why does it have to start again? Because Habim are trying to teach us that. That's the beginning of a new task and role that Am Israel has as Bnei Israel that are called Shivtei Ya, the tribes of God. Now the word Shivtei, Sfat Emet tells us, Masa Shevet. Shevet, there is a meaning to it that means like it's a stick that you put in your hand that helps you lead the way. So Sfat Emet says that Shivtei Ya were the ones who were creating now a new phenomena where it's not just one individual who are gonna shape and change the world and transform the world into a new reality. But now it's a role of a whole group that we call Shivtei Ya. Now, when we talk about Shemot, Shemot, as I said, is a name. So I wanna dig a little bit about the concept of name. There is what we call mispar, shemot bene Israel. We say that there is a number, and then we have shemot bene Israel. So we understand that the word number, mispar, means that we have to look at things as a global entity. Means that sometimes we look at things from macro, and sometimes we look at things from micro. Sometimes we only care about the group as a whole, and then the individual takes a backstage 
And sometimes the individual is the most important and actually that individual affects the group. So when we talk about, for instance, uh, leaders. So if it wasn't for the leader, the group would be lost. Maybe the group would be actually number of individuals, but because they have a leader, now they are combined with the leader to create the group. So we understand that there is some kind of a relationship between the individual and the group. So when they call us here, the El Shemot Bene Israel, and then each one is named separately. So we understand that the idea of the word Shem, Shem name, has very significant to allow us to understand how one individual is connected to the other in a way where without that individual, the whole is missing. And that is what the Torah is trying to tell us about Am Israel. Am Israel, yes, we are one unit. We also say Am Israel, kol echad arevim ze laze, bnei Israel arevim ze laze. Am Israel as the one unit need to know but we are responsible for one another. Implication in halacha that Rambam brings, I don't remember in what masechet, I forgot already, but the concept is there, where he asks a question. What happened when there is a group of Bnei Israel, a group of them, like let's say a thousand people, and, and comes uh, someone, a leader, who wants now to, let's say, punish the, the group, and says to them, choose one of you that I'm going to take as a sacrifice, which means he's gonna kill him, and the rest of you will survive. What's the halacha? What do we do in that? So Rambam explains that all the thousand has to die, and no one can say to one of the people, you go, you go. Because why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu et kol amispar, and each one is important and no one is more important than the other. Even though in the group could be people, let's say that are leaders, rabbis, and there is one simpleton, or even, even a criminal, or even a person who has done wrong, but they're in the thousand. But the person who wants to harm these thousand does not ask for a specific person with a name, but he says, you select that person. Uh, I don't know if you if you remember that it happened actually in the Jewish history where there was Mengele who was doing a selection, yes, turning people from left to right or 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 letting mothers choose which child you want to take with you. This one or that one, choose, forcing the mother to choose, which obviously it's impossible for any mother to choose. It's 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 a it's crazy phenomena, yeah. But it happened in reality. We cannot deny that this reality didn't take place. So when Rambam brings that halakha, for us, it's, it's a halakha, it's a knowledge that from the thousand, you tell us to choose one, we cannot. So everybody has to die. Rather than that, he says in his uh, one of his uh, section, he says, but if, if one person volunteers, means on his own, he says, I am volunteering, I'm taking my place, I'm, I'm giving up on my life, so you can survive. So Rambam says, oh, that's okay if the person makes the initiation. But otherwise, that cannot be. The person, everybody has to die if that is what is being asked for. And what happens if they ask for an individual, a specific individual? They said, oh, number X, you come out, you're going to be the sacrifice. Then obviously, Am Israel has to bring that person out because the name is clear, which means he was selected specifically and pointing to a particular person. What do we imply from all these phenomena that Rambam is giving us such a incredible possibilities about human life and their value? What we learn is definitely it's about Am Israel, that Am Israel is definitely first one unit. We are one unit. And the Gemara explains that when there will be 22,000 people, among Am Israel, if we have the number 22,000, then we have Shechina. That's what the Gemara says. The Gemara also says that imagine there is a woman who is pregnant, about to give birth, and that will create the number 22,000, which means all the 22,000 depending on that woman who is pregnant. 
And then the Gemara says, and there comes a dog who barks and frightens her to the point that she had a miscarriage. So Chachamim say that with Chas Vechalila, yes, God forbid that it should happen to anyone. But let's say that for that particular story. So what happened is that all the 21,999, no, 21,999, yes, uh, uh, now do not have Shekhinah. Why? Because the baby is not there. So even a baby who is not even have a voice yet, and doesn't have a character or anything, but the fact that she is now in the number 22,000, we have the Shechina. So now we understand that A, the Mispar is very important, which means the global. But we also understand that the Shem itself is extremely significant in what way? So now Chachamim tell us that a name means, and I'm going to call it, A name means the ability of one to reach the goal of and the purpose of what's the reason he is in this world. So each and every one of us, God already said when, when we were giving a name, yes, each one has a name, we are to discover within the name what is our purpose and goal in this world. And each and every one of us has to go through the path and journey to obtain that name. That's why when we talk about Yaakov Avinu, what do we say about Yaakov Avinu? The saying that the name and the face of Yaakov Avinu here in this earth, whatever he has gone through and whatever experience he has done and every decision he has done and all his path, the face over here in this world while Yaakov was alive, and, I mean, until the last day of his life, yes, was the very same face up there in Kisya Kavod. Which means Yaakov Avinu is the one who lived a full life. That's why it says Vayechi Yaakov. And I said I said it last week, yes, that Yechi, you start with Yud Chet Yud, and then you go backward, it's also Yud Chet Yud. To signify that the Yaakov's life was full of purpose and he has completed his task in this world. So here we are, each and every one of us has a name. The name is combined with what? Name is combined with letters. And when you put them together, there is vowels. And the vowels also are part of what? Of our name. Yeah. So if someone is called, let's say, Ilanit, let's just say, yes. And the other one is says Ilan, and the other one is Ilana or Helena. Every time the, the vowel changes or one letter changes, it already changes the purpose and the goal and the journey of that person. So now... We have to see in this parasha, not only that we have the Shemot of Bnei Israel, and that each and every one of them as individual has a meaning and purpose in this world, but they are also, what does it say? Habaim Mitzrayma, that they came to Egypt. And then again, they repeat, it says, Et Yaakov, Ish Uveito Ba'u. A man and his household came. Why do we have this repetition? To tell you that Am Israel enters Egypt and Egypt is considered the, the, the hey, the, which means the most uh, significant place in activating all possible of what? Of Tum'ah of impurity. Now, what does it mean, this impurity, that we continually say that Mitzrayim is Eretz Ha'erva, the, the land of revelation, the land of everything is revealed, everything is transparent, everything is allowed, you could manipulate nature in any possible you want, there are no boundaries, you, you could free yourself to do any exercise that has to do with your desires or with your senses and, and everything is permitted. In a way, I know it's very difficult for, for us, you know, to understand the, the Egyptian culture of that time, but Rashi did not stop telling us exactly what was the behavior, the daily behavior of the people in Egypt. As a matter of fact, when we depart from Egypt, God tell, instructs Am Israel, you know, I'm, I'm leading you in the desert and I'm going to lead you to Eretz Israel. And in the interim, you're going to receive the Torah. 
And you need to remember, Hemaaseh Eretz Mitzrayim, lo ta'asu. Means I know, God says to Amisra, I know your habits. I know the culture you came from. You caught up with the Egyptian culture. You can't say it did not influence you. You cannot say that it did not leave a print in your identity and in your being. But I'm asking you that you have to uh, remove yourself, like un undo, uh, almost like, uh, like uproar all, all, those, all those habits because we are not going to allow that to take place, A, when you receive the Torah, B, when you enter Israel. And what was it? The main, 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 main thing that God is asking Am Israel is liot gadur ba'ariot, which means to build boundaries in anything that has to do is revealing the nakedness. And Rashi tells us there, kemaseh eret mitzrayim lo ta'asu, as the land of Egypt you should not do no more. And they say there were gays, there were lesbians, there were, there were anything you want. It was the law of the day. It was okay. There was no shame, no, no right and wrong. And God says, no, this is, this is a chaotic society. We did not bring boundaries and therefore it's bound to be destroyed. It's bound to be erased because God doesn't want that kind of culture to be the culture of society. God wanted that there would be certain rules. Now, I need to tell you, Am Israel, not only that they were not supposed to do all those behavior, there was another law, set of laws that they received before even receiving the Torah, and that is that they are not allowed to marry their relatives, certain relatives that maybe the Goim are allowed, we are not allowed. And, and it says there that Am Israel cried le mishpechotam, vayivku le mishpechotam. And, and, and Rashi tells us what they were crying about. What, what? Because they had such a hard time accepting the fact that they will not be allowed to have relationship with, with let's say, a brother and sister. Because you have to understand, the Torah tells us, yes, Chazal at least tells us, that the brothers of, the brothers, uh, 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 the sons of Yaakov married their sisters. Maybe, maybe not the, from the same mother, yes, but they did marry their sisters. That's one of the understanding of Chachamim about the, 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 the way they uh, fruitful and multiply. And God says, no, that, that also is not allowed. And they were crying to tell you that it was one of the most difficult tasks that Am Israel had to create a whole new set of laws of what's allowed and what's not allowed. Now, if we look at Egypt, it was okay. You wouldn't think twice. You wouldn't think it's wrong. Oh, you, you feel like, yeah, you know, this is what you like. Go ahead, do it. They actually encourage this kind. Now, in history, when we move thousands of years later, we see that the Greek society and the Rome society did the very same thing. That format of culture and, and that liberalism, call it, yes, has, has, has been done also in that period of history. And we're going now moving again and we see the 21st century, that this phenomena also repeat itself in certain countries with new laws that are violating definitely the purpose and goal of God's uh, will in this creation. So we understand that uh, when it says here, Ishu Veitobau, a man and his household came, that they were supposed to bring a whole new um, illumination into the Egyptian culture, that things had to be changed. Now, then it says in Pasuk Chet, Vayakom Melech Hadash al Mitzrayim asher lo yada et Yosef. It means we're talking about a new generation that they refused to recognize Yosef. Now, what kind of imprint in his uh, kingship of 80 years left Yosef on Egypt? Chachamin tell us that one of his laws that he, he did for Egypt is actually that he asked all the men to, to do circumcision. And not only that, he moved all the people from their places that they used to be uh, living, and he uprooted them to completely different place 
having in mind that God wants them to, uh, that Yosef wanted them to really become what we call Hebrews. Yes, he wanted the Egyptian to become Hebrews, but the Lot Salah, he did not, uh, 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 not go through, he did not follow through. Because it says here, Ve'yakom Melech Chadash, a new king came up, Al Mitzrayim, upon Egypt, Asher lo yada et Yosef, that they refused to recognize the legacy of Yosef and what he has left. And therefore, not surprised, we see that they're trying now to take the, the, the Hebrews, yes, and to uh, uh, shape them to become Egyptians rather than maintain their Hebrew uh, nationality. I want to skip from there and go again to the word. We have the word Shem again. Uh, okay, let's look uh, how we have a name for someone who doesn't have a name. And that is, uh, it says here, Vayelech Ish. Okay, I'm going to put the word Um So let's talk first about the meyaldot. Yes, we have a meyaldot, women who are giving uh, uh, like doulas, yes, helping to give birth, midwives, and we don't have a name to them. It says only who are the, 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 got the, name, the other name. Um, yeah, shifra, shifra bepua. Now, if you look at Rashi, Rashi will tell you what's a shifra bepua, the long name of people. This is actually the, the name that they carry is what they have done to the baby. That shifra is from the word leshaper, means like to make the baby looks good, wipe her, her uh, tap her on, on the back so she can start to cry if the baby needs to cry, yeah, he or she. Uh, so the word shifra is from, from improvement, yes? She was doing something to make them look better. And pu'a, pu'a is from the word that she used to uh, uh, call in their ears, make, make, their, uh, make a specific voice that is very similar to the noise of the womb that will come the baby immediately. Yes, they would say like, ooh, 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 voice like that, because this is the voice they hear in the uterus. And the infant immediately starts to listen and become, yes, so mix, meaning that they would allow the transition of the baby to come from the fetus to life in a, in a, in a I would say effortless transition, something more nice and smooth rather than traumatic and, and, and uh, difficult. But then he, he is the one who talks to them and he tell them, uh, you should do such and such, but that's not their name. Their name is actually Yochevet and Miriam. Yochevet is the mother of Moshe that we're gonna see in the, in, in the further psukim. And, and Miriam is his sister, but they have a different name. They have a name of Shifra and Pua to tell us that the name of a person is definitely matches what their purpose in life. Whatever they do, it carries as a name. And then we have in Perek Bet, Pasuk Aleph, we have again something uh, uh, interesting that has to do with name. And it says here, Vayelech Ish, and a man doesn't say its name, Vayelech Ish, Mi Bet Levi, from the tribe of Levi, and he took the daughter of Levi. And then it says, that the woman became pregnant, and she gave birth to a boy. I don't want to go further because I want to talk a little bit about what happened to that baby, but I just want to go back into the concept of what? Of name. And what do we learn about this concept? We understand that sometimes the name of a person is hidden, but the action is most important. And what Chachamim tell us, Rashi tells it to us, that this ish, his name is Abram. And this woman, her name is Yochevet. And somehow the names are hidden here. What is it that it needed to be hidden? Because the most significant part is the action. We need to focus, to focus on the action rather than about the name at this point. And what Chachamim tell us that in the time where the Egyptians started to enslave Am Israel, as we all know that happened during the previous Sukkim, that Amram, this man, 
told all the tribe, all, uh, all Bnei Israel, all the tribes, that they should omit from being with their wives because it's a, the, the, it's, it's a very bad time to give, to give birth to children because they are going to die. And so what's the purpose? We should refrain from coming uh, to be with, with uh, their wives. And Miriam, the daughter, yes, and you have to understand the name Miriam is a very strong name because it's, the name Miriam has a lot of words in it. One of it is Merim. Merim means lift up. Merim means above, yes? They are above the, the way that we see things on a face value. They're above it. Also, from the word Merim, Yam, Mayim, yes? And we know that the source of water that Am Israel received, yes, while they were in the desert, actually was due to Miriam. But in her name, we see already what the meaning and purpose of her life. Yes, she is lifting everyone above, and she's the source of all my, my means also what? Torah. And what was her Torah? What was her education? That she came to her father and she told him, you know, Parao is a very bad man. He really wants to slaughter all the boys that are, are, are going to be born. But you're worse than him because you deprive from the girls to come into the world. Now we know that in the Jewish uh, um, religion and identity, the nationality, it goes by the mother, which means even if a daughter married Egyptian, her child is still going to be a Jew. And if she gives birth to a girl, her, her daughter is still Jewish. Yes, because the, the, the nationality of Am Israel and the religion is one, and it carries by the mother. The mother is the one who follows that, that let's call it the gene of, of, of Jew, Jewishness. So Miriam tells Amram that, and Rashid tells us that because she opened his eyes to understand his mistake, he remarried his wife, Yochevet. So Yochevet gave birth to Aharon and Miriam, and now she is to give birth to another child. Before I go about that child, as we all know, is Moshe, I still want to go back to Moshe later on because what does he say? You know, the parasha uh, tells us uh, the story is very, very fast. And therefore I could go back uh, forward and then move uh, backwards to tell us um, about the name, because this is my topic uh, as of now. Okay, but here it is. Uh, Hashem reveals to Moshe, yes, in Peregimel. And it says like that, Moshe tells Hashem uh, in Pasuk Gimel and Pere Gimel, yes, chapter 3, Pasuk 13. Moshe Ela Elohim. And Moshe tells God, Okay, let's say I'm coming to Bnei Israel. And I will tell them, The Lord of your father sent me to you. What's his name? What should I tell them? So here we see that Moshe Rabbeinu also not only talks about Am Israel that has a name, yes, each one has a name, but also now he's asking Hashem, which name should I use when I appear to Israel? And this is really something to ask us. What does it mean, what's name? We all know his name is, is Elohim, God. That's his name. What is it that he's trying to tell them? Which name should I use? And interestingly enough, God actually answers Moshe. And what does he tell him? Now we know two formats that are clear, more than two, that are in the Bible so far. Yes, in Sefer Bereshit chapter one, we had the name Elohim. And I spoke a lot about it throughout my classes. Yes, that Elohim means all the powers of all the forces of the world in this world are actually obtained by him. And therefore we say that the word Elohim in Gimatria, when we turn it into numerical, yes, like the letters, it's going to be the word Hateva, which means the nature. What does it mean that the word Elohim, which is kol kulam, reveals himself in nature? 
But then in chapter two, we found that there is another name to God. And that's the name yud Hey vav K. Then we have El Shaddai, yes. Then we have El, then we have uh, uh, Hanun, Rachum, the Hanun, that God has all these attributes of being merciful and kind and so forth and so forth. Start a minute, there's a something very interesting about the names of God. And he said, obviously the name of Hashem is one. It's only one. The, the way he reveals himself in this world, yes, Surotav Rabbi, the way God reveals himself has many shapes. Yes, he has many ways of showing God, show, God shows himself that we interpret it in spat bene Adam which means that we can rely to it. We should have a language that we could use to relate to God and to rely to him in a way where we show some of his attributes. In Ken, he says, all the names of God is a very specific way how he uh, reveals and, and leads himself in this world. So when Moshe asked Hashem, Ma Shmo, what name should I use to go to Am Yisrael? Spatermit says the question is a direct question about the condition of Am Yisrael during that period. As we all know, the previous Tzukim tell us that Am Yisrael is being tortured, enslaved, uh, killed, slaughtered, whipped. Uh, they have no identity whatsoever. The idea of, of, of Paro was to not allow any Jew, any Hebrew in this case, yes, to have a minute of thought, I am an individual. I was born as, as, as a free, free person that I'm allowed to think and I'm allowed to choose and I'm allowed to live my life the way I want. That had to be erased, that part of the identity. Now, we need, you need to know girls that we had it in our culture, in, in society, the most modern society, Germany and Europe, that that exactly what they did again to the Jews. It's, it is one of the most incredible history period of five years where Am Israel in Egypt had that experience for 80 something years. Day in and day out. Getting up in the morning and knowing that they had no identity, they were not supposed to. And Am Israel fought, fought so hard to obtain their identity as Hebrews. That's why Chachamim tell us that the reasons that Am Israel was zoche had the merit to be freed from that slavery is because they have been very stubborn about three things. Shelosh inuit leshonam, that they made sure to talk their Hebrew. That is so important to learn Hebrew. And that is where we give credit to all the beautiful people in all the diaspora that build yeshivot, that they teach, they teach the Hebrew. The fact that the kids don't speak it, but they understand it is a very big value to their identity, yes? Like, mm -hmm. a, like a, uh, we say uh, in some schools, it's called Vayomer, and he says, yes, they only translate it to them. Uh, those who learn Hebrew and Hebrew, which says Vayomer, the who am I? Mm -hmm. But at least, at least we still know that there are Hebrew words. So Shelotinu et Veshonam. Then Shelotinu et Shmam. They didn't change their names, which means Reuven was the father. Then the child, let's say, is Shimon. And mm -hmm. the, the grandchild is going to be also named what? Reuven. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's how we know. For instance, uh, my, my oldest uh, sisters. Yes, uh, if, if I ask what's your name, let's say one will tell me uh, my name is Sima and Simcha, and that was my grandmother's name. So now we know that this name is going to repeat itself again and again with their grandchildren. That means the lo shinu et shmam. But here we have a deeper meaning. Shelo shinu et shmam, that did not change their name, that they kept their inner identity 
of understanding that despite of the fact that now it's dark and it's bad, but we are going to snap out of it and we are going to be seeing the light. Now, who gave them that hope? As Viktor Frankl says in his book, lived during the Holocaust, yes, he was in Auschwitz, survived it only to write his book and his actual psychotherapy logo, yes, approach, which he said that when a person has a meaning to life, he will endure and he will overcome no matter what kind of horrible suffering and torture that he's going through. And Viktor Frankl is right because that was Am Israel. Am Israel's hope from generation to generation, remember there are 210 years in Egypt from generation to generation and a generation is about 25 years. So you can imagine how many generations passed so far. Yosef before his death gives a direction to all Am Israel, yes, to whoever was there to teach it to their children and the children to their children that there will be a code is called Otchem Hashem. This is at the end of Parashat Bereshit, the last words of Yosef to Am Israel, to whoever was there, is Pakod is called Hashem Etchem. Hashem is going to come and redeem you. So when Moshe Rabbein asked Hashem, Mashmo, Mashalem, with which way you're going to redeem Am Israel? You promised Yosef Pakod is called. You told it to Yaakov, Yaakov told it to Yosef, Yosef told it to Yosef. <laughs> In which format you're going to redeem Am Israel? Sfatemet says something amazing. Sfatemet actually was saying that Moshe Rabbeinu was argued with Hashem to tell him, I don't understand. What do you need me to help you redeem Am Israel? Why can't you use your own magic, as you, if we let us say yes? Why can't you use your own miracles and just deliver them? You don't need me. Therefore, he says, Mashmo also. Sotemet says that Moshe Rabbeinu saw the suffering of Am Israel. And in a way, maybe he asked himself, where is God there? You know, Chachamim tell us that when someone, during the time of his hardships, when there is, when he falls into the pit, when, when there is a, 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 a very dark time in their life, do they still connect to God? Do they still feel the presence of God? Or actually they become what we call, many people happen to them in the Holocaust, they can hurt it. God wasn't there, there is no God. Moshe Rabbein is coming and telling Hashem, how are you going to appear there with all their suffering? How are they going to look up to you, God, and say, we believe in you, that you're going to redeem us and that you're going to let us out of that misery? And interestingly enough, the name God gives is a new name. It says, Eheye Asher Eheye. As explained again, it's not Yud K Vav K. It's Aleph Hey Yud Hey. Eheye. Now, in the Hebrew language, the word Eheye is from the format of the future. Yes, we know that the Shem's name is Haya, Hove, Yeye, is all one. Now, in, in the Hebrew language, what does it mean? Haya, Hove, Yeye, means God was, God is, and God will. Which means there is a one continuum with God. There is no really past, present, and future. It's all there. The say God sees the past, God sees the future, God is in the present, and for him it's all one entity, one way of seeing the world, and so forth. Here God says, I want you to tell Am Yisrael, Eheye, I'm with you looking to the future. Which means that Moshe, Hashem tells Moshe, I'm going to build with Am Israel the faith, the emunah, that there is a future, that there is a freedom, that there is a new people who would be under my wings. And you need to know, ladies, 
עם ישראל הוא זוכה, I had the merit to be in the desert under the clouds of God. It was a whole new word in Hebrew, Havaya. Again, same letters. Havaya means a whole uh, entity, a whole new phenomena where we are on earth, or really we are in Gan Eden. For 40 years, Am Israel was under the Shekhinah, under the protection of God. As Chachamim tell us, yes, they, they, they ate the man, yeah, the man, the food that God gave them was Lechem Abirim. Masa Lechem Abirim, that's the name of the man. It's a bread that goes into all the organs. Abirim from the word Evarim, whoever knows Hebrew, organs. That they didn't have to go to the bathroom because the, the food was swallowed all over them and maintain them intact as if 40 years was 12 hours. Their, their clothes did not, didn't get wrinkled, didn't get dust because they were in those very specific clouds of heaven. <clears throat> it is the most interesting time period that Chachamim called the people of the desert do de'a the generation who experienced, because the A means you experience God's presence. So obviously there were many levels to it. Yes, once the Mishkan was built, Moshe goes into the Kodesh Kodeshim, all goes into the Mishkan. The, the light that Moshe had, yes, this holiness is definitely in a much higher level than Am Israel, but still all Am Israel were under the wings and clouds of God. So when Hashem says, Eheye, Asher Eheye, he means to say, God says, be with me to the future. What does it mean? It means that despite and because of your suffering, you need to know I'm there. I'm not only there when things are nice and great, that you should be thankful and happy, go lucky, I have everything I need, I can do this, I'm free to do that. I can exercise my freedom. I could actually show my will and God will love the fact that I'm actually showing my will. Yeah, no, God says, can you recognize God's presence in your suffering? Because those sufferings are going to actually shape who you're going to be. And that's part of God's purpose in this world, that the suffering is part of the growth. Without it, you're not going to be the same person. So when we use the word eheye, remember, it's looking to the future. Now, Tzfat Emet tells us something very interesting. He says, Asheila shel Moshe, ma shmo? The question of Moshe, what's the name of God that you're going to reveal to us? Yashir lamatzav boi nitunim. It is direct into the situation they were in. In what format you are actually leading the exile and the Mitzah, Mitzah from the word what? Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim means that they, they, they closed on them. Yes, like someone is, you say? I'm sure. Okay. So Meitzel means closing up on you. So each and every one of you can imagine what's the feeling in, when something is closing up on you slowly, 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 that you feel that you don't have air to breathe, <clears throat> that you're about to vanish. Hashem says, Moshe says, this is the situation of Am Yisrael. They almost lost any hope. They're in such a difficult situation. And God answered him, Eheye asher eheye. Tell them to look to the future. Tell them to still have hope. Tell them not to be afraid. Even if you feel this is your last breath, I can always revive you. But you need to believe. So Rashi says there that Hashem told him, Eheye asher eheye. And Rashi says there, that the Shem is going to be, tell them, I'm going to be with you in this exile and in future exiles. And Moshe Rabbeinu 
tells Hashem, go to court. It doesn't say here, but the commentaries say that. God, are you kidding? How am I going to tell them you're going to be in the future exiles where they, they, they are so dumb in this, they need to know that there's going to be another one and another one? Now, we, we need to look, imagine each and every one of you were in all the four exiles, yes? We had Egypt, we had Babel, we had Yavan, and we had the Rome, and Rome is the longest one, 2,000 and something years, okay? No more exile, Bo Hashem Am Israel is in Eretz Israel, yes? No more exile. But think about it that if you had a video of your past experiences and you see that actually what God said, eh, yes, there, eh, yes, is the reality he was given to Moshe. This is the destiny of Am Israel. The destiny of Am Israel is to experience exile. Now, if I would teach you Shira Shirim, I would tell you one by one, Shira Shirim explains actually that this is going to be the very big period of history of Am Israel, which means exile. Now, Sfat Emet say something phenomenal. Let's see what he says. He says, Hagalut eina fisaron ban haga. Exile doesn't mean that it's a deficiency. It's a lack of something in the way God leads the world through the Hebrew, through Am Israel. Ela, rather than, sheyesh la tachlit mitzad atzma. It has its own deep, deep, deep reasoning and purpose. Reasoning and purpose. So what is the destiny of Am Israel? I started with giving the name to each individual of Am Israel and looking at them also as a one tribe, Shivteya the tribes of God, Yud K. yes? We are the tribes of God. We have a mission. We have a purpose in this world. And what is the purpose? A, that the plan of exile is part of God's purpose, which means if we had to go to Bavel for 70 years after being in Eret Israel for 430 years, yes, once we entered Eret Israel with Yeshua, 430 years we were there, Beautiful nights nice. we've done whatever we needed to do at that time. Failed in so many other areas in Eretz Israel, yes? Because remember, the destruction of the, the first temple was what? Of the Avodah Zarah, Tichud Amin, Gilu Erayot. Oh, you, you were not much different than the people of that place that you uh, lived in, in this uh, civilization. Yeah, I thought that Am Israel would will change, will shape the, 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 the land, especially Eret Israel, yes, which is a holy place. I'm not saying that it was like that throughout all the 430 years, but push come to shove after 430 years, God says that's it's time for exile. Now, if you learn Gemara and you learn it very well, you will be surprised to know that those 70 years that Am Israel stayed in Babel. Now, Mazer Babel, what is Babel? If you look again, part of Sefer Bereshit, Bavelis was the area where all languages were what? Mixed. Yes, Migdal Bavel. They go back to Bavel and Chachamim, they there. They had to do a big tikkun there. They had to do a lot of correction there. Why? Because so many oh, so many lights, spiritual lights, were actually there in the land of Bavel that were waiting for Am Israel to take it and awaken it. Now, as a metaphor, we need to understand what does it mean? It means that in this whole universe, according to Kabbalah, when, when Adam, the first Adam, yes, that we are talking about, when, uh, when he fell through the, the greatest place he was in his ability to see the world from beginning to end and, and, and awesome, awesome, awesome power, spiritual power and light that he had, yes, he had such kind of illumination in God when God created him that he could see through all the whole universe. He could see everything. He could see history. He could see civilization. He could know so many. He was like a master of all knowledge. And then when he had eaten from the forbidden fruit, his reality con continue, uh, completely changed. It's like being 100, zero. Start now. The loss of, Abraham, of Adam memory and knowledge caused him to be 110 years in mourning. 
in, in sorrow and grief. And only after that, he started somehow to snap out of it and he gave birth to his son, which from him, the world was established that we call him Shet, yes? Kind of Hevel, gone, that civilization was gone. And all, whatever we have from civilization coming from Shet. Interesting that he has the word Shin and Taf, almost like the word Shem. And his child, that he's gonna give birth that from him, the Hebrews come, is actually Shem, yes? Because Shem gives birth to many children, but Shem is the one that will bring Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, the Hebrews, Nei Israel, to complete again God's purpose in this world. So, so God, so Am Israel has a mission. What is it like? I will use that metaphor. Imagine you have a fruit. Now, Maybe in Tubish Vat, I should give you that class because it's an amazing class about fruits and, and their essence and their meaning. Let's talk, let's take about few fruits, okay? Let's take, for instance, banana. It's easy to peel the peel of the banana. It's a quite thick peel and definitely we don't eat it. Also, the banana itself, you can eat it when it's green, and really not, not healthy, not ripe. It has to be ripened. But when it's ripened, it's actually good. According to nutritionists, it's good to eat banana, but not good to eat alone. You are supposed to combine it with others to really get the nutritious uh, benefit. So what do I learn? I learned that there are some fruits that A, you have to wait till the peel becomes soft. B, that you have to wait for the fruits to ripe, and then you can enjoy it. Let's take another uh, fruit, coconut. Wow, the coconut? To, to get rid of that, that uh, shell. I can't do it in my hand. Oh, I have to wait to see a very specific technique that you, you know, you make a hole in the middle and then suddenly, yalla, you can open it. And then inside, there is juice, so sweet. And the fruit itself is crunchy. You need strong teeth. That's another kind of fruit. Let's take another one. Let's take, for instance, an apple. The peel is very thin. The fruits is juicy, and actually I can eat the peel and the inside. And I have to, use, to be careful that what? The inner pit I have to get rid of. I'm not supposed to eat it. I'm supposed to plant it so I can have more fruits, right? So what do we learn? This metaphor of, of the, the, the clipa and the fruit and the, and, and the, the shell and the, the, the fruit itself, that it is a task that a human being learned how to use in order to benefit from those fruit trees. Same thing, same concept. We are talking about Am Israel going in every part of exile. And over there, we are supposed to get rid of the shell and get what we call the Nitzotzot. Nitzotzot means illuminating forces, positive forces that are hidden there. And we are supposed to take it to ourselves so we can bring the illumination into the world. This is the task that was given to the tribe of Shivtei Ya. Because we had the Merkava, Avota Merkava, the fathers of the concept of creating, as I said, Chesed, Emet, Vegvua, and then the sword from the Sef, Atzadik, yes, means that he was able to. Uh, uh, control all the thing that has to do with erva, yes, with, with nakedness. He mastered it. He gave it as a gift to whom? To the children. This is, again, part of the parashiot that I explained in, your, in our previous parashiot. I talked a lot about it. I'm just repeating it a little bit. And to see that there is a continuous. Am Israel has a task. Fat Emet tells us exile is part of it. Obviously, not only exile, because we have the word Galut, which means exile in English. And then we have Geula. Now we have the word. Pay attention to the word. We have Gala the Gaal. What's the difference? The He turns into a Alex. Right? Gala Gimel Lamed He. And Gaal is Gimel Aleph Lamed. Now the He in Gala is at the end. The Gaal, the, the Aleph, is in the, in, in the middle. And in between those uh, Aleph and He, we have the word what? Gal. Mazegal, it's a wave. 
which means Am Israel is destined to go through what? Waves, yes? Certain difficulties they are gonna go through in order to feel what? We don't want the hey now, we want the Aleph. What is the Aleph so special about? Because the Aleph, according to the alphabet letters, is the master letter of all letters that when Hashem wanted to create the world, he put all the letters and he says, should I create it with this and that and that all the letters? And then when it came to the letter Beth, Hashem says, yes, I'm gonna take that letter and I'm gonna uh, create the world with the word Bereshit. Because it's come from the word Baruch. Baruch means blessed. Hashem says, listen, this world is gonna be very difficult. We might as well, yes, make it, bring it bracha. Baruch, that let it be blessed. Whom Hashem didn't ask because Hashem already decided on the letter Bet. He didn't ask the letter Aleph. And Hashem, and, and the letter Aleph kept silent. He said, God decided that's it. But then God came to the letter Aleph and tell us, don't worry the letter Aleph. You're a very good letter, but you'll have to wait. You'll have to wear 2,600 years from creation where God started the Ten Commandments and started with the word, Anochi Hashem Elokecha. The Kabbalah explained that the letter Aleph is extremely powerful, but it has to what always? Wait. It's about waiting. Because from Gala, Legeula. From Galut, Legeula. From exile, to redemption. Now, there's few purposes to exile, as we said, I'm about to complete uh, the, this concept. Hashem says, Wait a second. Are you doing all those miracles, all your way of revealing yourself to Am Israel? You're doing it for Am Israel or for the Egyptian? Here it says, to know that I am God. Now we know very well that when Moshe appears to Paro, Paro says to him, what? That name, Yud K. Vavke? Never heard of it? Didn't exist? Not in my dictionary. Not in Wikipedia. It doesn't exist. There is no Yud K. Vavke. There is only what? This name, that name, that name. Yes? But, yes? But God, it's impossible. It doesn't happen. It's not going to happen. It doesn't exist because we have all powers and we know all about them. And Moshe had to prove Mitzrayim, not only Am Israel. I believe that Am Israel already knew it, but it was a teaching to the Egyptians. Now, according to the commentaries, all the Egyptians really suffered a lot throughout those 10 plagues. And as we all know, when the crossing of the, of the sea, well, all the soldiers and most of the people died there, yes, under the ocean. The Chachamim tell us that Paro was saved. And Paro didn't go back to Egypt. According to the Mefarshim, he left Egypt and he went to Nineveh and he created there a new dynasty that their, their philosophy was that there is a God. Not only the, the, the God who reveals himself through nature, but there is the God Balvek. And what's his name? Yud Vavke. So now we understand uh, <clears throat> not only that the Egyptian had to learn and study what's the name of God. Yes, that he rules everything as we say, Hashem Hu Ha Elohim, which means God who reveals himself above nature is the same God who is in nature but he's just what? Hidden. He hides himself in nature, allowing people to have the free choice he wanted them to exercise, hoping and praying that within that freedom, they will find God as well. Now, when Am Israel crosses the ocean, what did they say? They say, Hashem ish milchama, Hashem shmo. Again, they use the word what? Name. Some Israel comes to terms also, not just the Egyptians. The God is a warrior and God is his name, which means God can 
take nature and governs over it. And that is a learning that Am Israel had to learn as not only as individuals, but as a global entity. Shivtei Ya, the tribes of UK, of Hashem. Now, I, Ms. Alou, I have a question. I have yeah. a question. Yeah. Um, how is, well, we can look back and we can look in the Torah and we can see through history that the name Eheyeh, we understand the concept of I'm with you, I'm, I'm there for you. Why? We have history that shows us Hashem has always been with us and we can always look back and we can have hope. But how is that an answer to the first generation who are sitting in Mitzrayim, their children are being killed. How is that an answer to them? Very good. I'm, with I'm sorry that I forgot to correct it, but Moshe told Hashem, how do you want me to go to them and tell them you will be with them in this suffering and in the future suffering? That doesn't make sense. And Hashem agrees with him. And therefore, okay. just tell them, hey, yeah. thank you for, for pointing that. I was about to say it, and then I guess I uh, detract myself. I would have loved to talk to you more about uh, another concept if you have at least five minutes with me. Do you? Yes. Maybe yes. We have to go. Yeah, no, we have time. Okay. So one of the things that I wanted to discuss with you is another thing that has to do a lot with, with, with the spirituality and that we're talking about is what happened in the birth of Moshe. When when uh, the woman gave birth, as I read that Pasuk, I'm going back now, chapter 2nd, Pasuk 2. And she saw that he is good. Now, the word ki tov goes back again to Sefer Bereshit, where God created the light in the first day. And what did Hashem see? Vayar ki tov. Hashem saw that it was good. The, the, the Midrash tells us that this ki tov is that the mother saw something in Moshe. She saw that he will be able to reveal or haganus. or haganus. So we have to go back to, again, Sefer Bereshit, because I told you that Sefer Shemot is called Sefer Hashemi, the second book, which means that it is exactly like Sefer Bereshit, but in a different level. So now, when we look at Bereshit, a bit in front of me, but we all know that when Hashem created the light, Bayar Kito. And this is not the light we're talking about what happened on Wednesday, where God put all the instruments of the sun and the moon, yes? We're talking about before that phenomena, before this came to place, there was a completely different light. That light is called or a ganuz. Maze ganuz, ganuz means hidden, which means it's there, but you can't see it. Why? Because it's covered. What is it covered with? It's covered with the world. Rav Yaakov Yosef HaKohen says to us about uh, Tehillim. I think it's uh, chapter 91 or 92. Here we describe how God, David Amir described how God created the world. And it uses the word Ote or Kasalma. Okay, write those words. Ote or ein vav te he or kasalma. But Hashem covered the light. Kasalma. Salma is a change of letters, which means simla. What's a simla, but not? It's a dress. Yes? Simla is a, is, a, is a gown. Yes? So God covered that light with a dress, which means the light is there, but it's covered. It's like, you know how you have those uh, very interesting lamps that we use on Shabbat, uh, if you want it under your bed. So you put the light on, but then you cover it, like you snap it like that, and then it's dark again. But if you want to use it, let's say on bed, and you want to read, 
then you open it a little bit and it's allowed to use on Shabbat. They didn't put the light and it's not light, but really it is light, yes? Same idea. There was that spiritual light that gives you a complete difference insight about the world, seeing things further and further and further, having the kind of knowledge that will allow you to predict and see things in a way where the human being wears the earthly glasses cannot see. So <clears throat> you have it, the mother of Moshe. So that Moshe has that organ. But uh, he will have that ability to foresee and have that gift of seeing things way above the human being's eyes uh, that is masked by nature. So things that we understand in nature, really, it's like almost like a joke because that is a mask. And the real things that happen, you must wear different glasses. Asfat Emet says that a person who has that ability to have organs, he lives a life where he says two things. He says, Gam tova, tova. This is also for good and everything is good. Tova, everything happens for good. The tzaddik, the righteous person who learns Torah day and night, develops this kind of uh, insight of understanding that even in the depths of the suffering and in the dark of darkness, God's light is there. Again, David Melech, he says, even in the darkest of dark, there is light. Again, one of them is Morim of 19, something like that. Maybe next time I'll, I'll quote it for you. So I'll show you. So we understand that Yochevet was Zoha to understand that Moshe has the potential to bring Am Israel and to give them the ability to be always in touch with Or Haganu, with that light. And the way we can get to it is when we refine one's character and we learn Torah for many, many years. One day, this organus is being revealed to us. And this organus revealed only to Am Israel. Also, Batia, when she opened the, the, the teva, yeah, when she opened his basket, it says there, Vatere, Vatirehu, Kinaa, Kieled, and I don't have time to elaborate on it. But what Chachamim tell us that Batya was on her path to convert. So she was still a Goya, she was still in a, 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 like Egyptian, but she was about to convert because we all know that she converted and she came back with Am Israel and she exited Am Israel and went to Eretz Israel with us. But she had the ability to see that there is something there. She couldn't see like Yochevet, but she did see. One more thing that maybe next week we're gonna more elaborate on it about Moshe himself. We're gonna talk more, not only about what's happening to Am Israel with all the Makot, because we already have in this parasha part Makot, but I didn't wanna focus on that because we have been dwelling on those things so many times. I wanted to give you a different twist and a different way of looking at the parasha so we understand a depth. Uh, and next week we're gonna talk a little bit also about Moshe as a human being, as a personality, and see who shaped and what shaped his life to be the very special person he was for Am Israel and for himself. Thank you so much.